Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we started with our part one of our two-parter case and we spoke about the six dockets that police were looking into with regards to a man who was leading women to their demise in the Mulder's Drift area. So today we are going to talk about how police ended up catching this man but sadly we are also talking about how another victim was added to this man's tally. But please just know that this video is graphic so please just be aware of that when watching this video. And if you have not watched part one of this case, and I'll link it up here for you. So please just give that a watch and then we'll all be caught up. So when we left off last week, we had just realized that the man had given his name as Lazarus Poppy. However, there was not really much to link him to any of these cases yet. So police ended up doing a little more digging and helping Dr. Gerard Labaskachny and Breaky Breitenbach was a lady named Captain Suzette Knutter. And she would help in a big way with regards to this investigation. So remember we lightly touched on her in last week's video where she made the random missed call to Lazarus. And now she's continuing to dig into the phone records of this Lazarus person. Because once he had answered the phone of Glenda, remember his last victim of the six docket case. So once he had answered Glenda's phone, they really thought that this could be their man and they wanted to dig more and more into who he was. So Captain Suzette then gave another missed call to this number and she received nothing for a couple of hours until 10 o'clock that night when she then received a call from a man who introduced himself just as Ponzo. And this man Ponzo, who still was using Glenda's old phone, said to Captain Suzette that she had a lovely voice and he really wanted to be given a chance with Captain Suzette. Basically, he wanted to ask her out on a date. So Captain Suzette tried to see if she could maybe wing it and see if she could get any other information out of him. And basically, they just ended up talking and she did agree to go on a date with this person. So while they were discussing the nitty gritty about this date, she continued to just talk to him and basically they would talk in a very friendly manner. So this was still all happening on the same night after 10 o'clock. So they were talking for hours and hours and then eventually Captain Suzette said that she had to go to sleep. She has work in the morning. So she then texted this Ponzo goodnight and then he responded back, sleep well. So then the next morning at six o'clock, Captain Suzette woke up to a good morning message on her cell phone. But he said that he was unable to talk during the day because he's actually a construction worker on the Gau train. And if you have never been to South Africa or particularly the Joburg, Pretoria area, the Gau train is basically a train that takes you from the airport all the way to a specific other area. But when Ponzo said to Captain Suzette that he was going underground and he couldn't message her during the day because he was a construction worker, Suzette kind of felt that she should milk this a little bit and be like, oh my goodness, that is so dangerous. I hope that you will stay safe all day because I'm really going to miss talking to you. So like really sweetening him up and really milking it. But he didn't respond to any of these messages. So later on in the evening when he did respond, all he said to Captain Suzette was that, that he works from 6 to 6 every single day, 7 days a week, and he goes underground every day. But then when Captain Suzette replied again after he said that he works 7 days a week, the sponsor guy then formally introduced himself. And he formally introduced himself as Lazzie Shivani Ponto Poppy. And he also described himself as tall, slender, and with a coffee colored skin tone. And he was in his 30s, single, no children, and that he didn't drink a lot. And he really liked sport. So Suzette and this Lazzie guy were still continuing their conversation. But then we skip forward a little bit to the 28th of May, 2010. And Breaky called Dr. Labaskachny to say that he actually had a new docket that had just been given to him, which apparently happened four days earlier based on attempted And this docket had been reported by a lady named Sibon Siwe. So Captain Suzette and a man named Colonel Jan de Lange, they both went to Deep Slurt, where apparently Sibon Siwe, she lived, and her phone had been stolen after the attack. So docket number seven was opened by a lady named Sibon Siwe. And she was 30 years old at the time. And on Monday, the 24th of May, 2010, Sibon Siwe went to Caxton newspapers in order to put a job seekers page within this newspaper as she was looking for a job as, as a domestic helper. At around two o'clock that evening, she received an SMS from a number that matched Lazzie's phone number. And this SMS said, quote, come, I want you. There's a job, bring clothes, stay over. And that SMS also told Siboni Siwe to go to Neugedag Primary School at 5 o'clock that same day. And apparently the SMS was then signed off by a person named Linda. 
So when Siboni Siwe went to Lion Park or Neutgedacht Primary School, she arrived there at five o'clock as told in the SMS. When she arrived there, she said that she got a call from a man who apparently sounded like a white male. And he then described that one of his employees would then meet her at the primary school. And then he described what his employee apparently was going to look like. The employee then met Siboni Siwe at six o'clock that night. And Siboni Siwe described him as a tall, thin black male who was apparently dressed very well. And when he got to her, he then introduced himself as Clinton. And Clinton said that his boss's name was Linda. So the two of them then start walking down this dirt gravel path. And Clinton starts describing how Siboni Siwe is going to work at a rose farm. And then while they were busy walking down this dirt path, this apparent Clinton pointed to a house that belonged to the boss, Linda. When Siboni Siwe was asked what language he spoke, did he have any defining characteristics? She did say that he spoke Shangan, Isizulu, and Setswana to her. Then, at around half past six at night, so they've been walking for about half an hour, they got near a massive bush, and this Clinton man then apparently grabbed Siboni Siwe and he instantly threw her to the ground, jumped on top of her, and put his hands around her neck and attempted to strangle her. While he was attempting to strangle her, he managed to grab out a knife as well, and he said to her that she must undress, and if she doesn't, he will then start to cut pieces off of her. But luckily, Siboni Siwe was able to overpower this Clinton guy and she pushed him off of her and she started booking it for this apparent boss's house. Remember Linda's house, who Clinton had pointed out earlier during their walk? But while Siboni Siwe was busy running, she basically collided with another man and both Siboni Siwe and this man were in shock. They both collided accidentally, but he noticed the state that she was in and he immediately took her to safety and took her to the nearest police station as well. Clinton stole Siboni Siwe's purse, which contained her cell phone, 200 rand, her Zimbabwean passport and some of the clothes that she had left on the floor. And Siboni Siwe described this man as 1.65 meters tall and of a coffee color complexion. So while police were trying to do everything that they could to try and get this man in their grasp, remember Captain Suzette was still trying to butter this guy up and to really play on how he found her attractive or her voice that he found attractive. So remember they were busy organizing a date between each other and this lazy guy said to Captain Suzette that they should meet at an engine near the Mulder's Drift area and she should just wait for him there and he will come to her. So this lazy Shivani Pontu Poppy man Remember said that now that he's going to meet Captain Suzette at the engine. So she now heads to the engine garage with two other police officers with her as well. So she goes in an unmarked police vehicle and parks at the engine garage. Captain Suzette then waited there for a little while. And while she was waiting, Dr. Gerard Lebeskachny also attended this like stakeout. And he parked his car there as well. And he noted the other police officers that were watching her as well. But unfortunately, when it came time to this Lazzy to actually meet Captain Suzette, he then messaged her and said that he's running out of airtime and he's unable to meet and they must do it another time. But when Captain Suzette told this to Gerard Labaskachny, he immediately ran into the little engine garage's like convenience store and he tried to buy airtime. And Suzette then sent it to this Lazzy guy, but there was no response further that night. And like I said, the police were working really, really hard to try and get any information on this guy. They even went to Home Affairs to try and track this guy's name down. Because remember, he had given Lazzy Shivani Ponto Poppy as his full name to Captain Suzette. So they went to Home Affairs, nothing. They even went to the Gau train where apparently he worked. And the Gau train manager who was there at the time said that they had so many workers coming in and out. Some left some days and some never returned. So they never really kept a formal employee list. But when Dr. Labaskachny actually asked the Gau train manager if they had any people of his name, they said yes, that they did have four but none matched his build and his description. So like I keep saying, police were really trying all different angles. And this next part is a little bit gross, so just a forewarning. But basically, police were busy tracking this lazy guy's phone all the time now because they weren't getting any meeting spots with him and they weren't getting any more details. So they had to try the next step. So Brakeys and Gerard now wanted Captain Suzette to call this lazy guy to see if they could get him on the line in order to track his phone. But when Captain Suzette actually called, there was no answer. But Gerard and Brakeys decided that they were just going to go to the basic area 
where this phone was located in. So they started driving to the area and then while they were driving, they actually got an SMS from this Lazzy guy to say, he's so sorry he didn't end up meeting Suzette last night, but he's ready to talk now and once again, he's very sorry. So Suzette tries to play it a little bit difficult to try and get Lazzy's attention. So she SMSs him back and says that, oh, you're just like all men always giving some lame excuse about not wanting to talk or not wanting to meet kind of thing. So this Lazzy guy then tries to call and Captain Suzette purposefully declines his call because then almost immediately he tries to call again. So Captain Suzette then picks up the phone and now they have him on the line. And while Lazzy and Captain Suzette were on the line, Gerard and Brakies were now following this phone signal until they went to Kaya Sands informal settlement. But by the time that they actually reached Kaya Sands, the sun was starting to set, it was getting really dark, but Brakies and Gerard were determined to try and find this guy. But when they were hot on the phone's signal, basically, it led them to this open field and Gerard and Brakies were really confused until they started looking around the field and they noticed that there were four ablution blocks or basically like portable toilets were on this field. So it was now 10 to 8 that night and another cop car had now pulled up next to Brakies and Gerard and Captain Suzette at the back. And in the second vehicle was a man named Gert de Klerk and and the scene that he now had to witness was basically this man, Lazzy, in the toilet, facing him, one hand on the phone talking to Captain Suzette, and the other hand down there, busy entertaining himself. So the cops now had to pull this Lazzy guy out of the toilet while he is indisposed, and they now had to arrest him with his handcuffs on and then pulled up his pants. So once the police actually had this Lazzy person in custody, he then introduced himself as Shivani Lazzy Poppy. And in his hand, talking to Captain Suzette, was Glenda's cell phone. So Shivani then led police and Captain Suzette to the home that he shared with one of his Gautrain co-workers. And they did search his home with his permission and they found another two cell phones, ID books, driver's licenses, firearms license, a Samsung cell phone, three watches and some graphic DVDs and magazines. So they then drove away from this informal settlement and they then took Shivani into the cells for the night. The next morning, once he was awake, they then took his DNA and they put it all into the database. So police now had Shivani in custody, but now they actually had to get a case together and to try and convict him of everything that apparently he had done because he was still innocent at this point. So police were trying to organize an ID parade so that the victims could come and identify the Shivani man. So once they've arranged this ID parade, they do actually ask all of the victims to come and identify them. So Captain Suzette was busy organizing all of the women and the day that Princess was scheduled to come, she didn't arrive at a time that was allocated to her. And when Captain Suzette then tried to call Princess herself, her cell phone was turned off, but then Captain Suzette tried later on as well and then her sister apparently answered the phone and her sister said that she was actually back in Zimbabwe. But then her sister called back again a couple hours later and said that actually she's not in Zimbabwe and that she's actually unsure where her sister is. So remember, Princess was the lady who was taken in the white BMW and there were four other guys in the car who her and she was a Zimbabwean citizen. So when Gerard was looking into this case, remember back in part one, I said that he thought that this case was a bit strange because it was out of the norm for this Mulder's Drift rape at the time. And Gerard does believe that the reason that Princess did not want to come to this lineup is because she felt that because she was an illegal citizen in South Africa at the moment, that she was scared of coming forward to police in case they wouldn't take her seriously because she was a Zimbabwean national here illegally. But Princess never came to the lineup and when they did take her DNA that was found on her body and then tried to match it to Shivani's DNA that they took after he was in the cell, it did not match. So Princess being there to identify Shivani in person was very critical, but because she was not there to identify him, her case was not included in the trial because they never heard from her again. So while police were busy organizing the ID lineup, they were also trying to organize a pointing out and a pointing out is when the suspect or the person in question for the case goes with police and points out where and what they have done at different various locations. And in the process and all the formalities of this pointing out, Shivani was asked which language he prefers and which language he wants to conduct this pointing out in. And Shivani said that he is happy with Isizulu, English and Setswana. He was also asked if he had ever been assaulted or hurt by the police and he said no, formally he had not. 
and this is important to note for later. So an officer named Colonel Marte was the one who took Shivani to to the apparent locations for him to point out, and also a gravel area under the highway. And while he was busy walking down the gravel area, he then pointed out a grassy and bushy patch where he said that he would then sleep with the woman. He also told Colonel Marte that he would find their contact details in the newspapers because they were busy looking for jobs. And when Colonel Marte went to this area where apparently Shivani slept with the woman, it was near Rudy's Rose Farm. So if you remember and you cast your mind back to last week's video where I spoke about Gerard Lebeskachny making GPS mappings because it was going to be important later, well, basically Gerard made GPS trackings of where the victims first said that they And what Colonel Marte was doing was he was also marking down GPS coordinates of where Shivani said that he had the woman. And basically, Dr. Gerard Lebeskachny was going to use these in the case later on because if Shivani could point out exactly as well where he had each woman, then he was kind of putting his foot in it and being at the location and pointing out the exact locations that the victims described as well. Then on the 9th of June, Captain Mike van Aert held the identity parade at the Maldersdorf police station. And only five out of the six original women from the six dockets came to point out Shivani. And Princess Remember was not in this identity parade or trying to identify Shivani. Also, the last victim, Siboni Siwe, was unable to identify Shivani as she said that it happened very quickly. But when Siboni Siwe did go there, she said that it could only have been two out of the men that were in this lineup. And one of them she did identify as Shivani. Then, on the 13th of June, Shivani Pop made a formal confession to Colonel Maduse, and I will read you part of his actual confession. Quote, I do not know what is happening to my mind. I have committed several... I have five women at an open fault near Tabumbeki squatter camp. I was making an appointment with them to promise them the job and meet them at the gate of Neutgedacht primary. From there, I would go with them to this open fault. When we arrive at the open fault, I would threaten them with a knife. Them. After raping them, I would just run away. I did not know all these women. I got their numbers from the Randberg son. I do not know what is happening to my mind. I think I have a problem because what I was doing is not good at all. Every time I did this thing, I would pray that I must not do it again. I always wanted to tell somebody about this problem that I have, but I was afraid to talk about it. I regret everything that I have done and I am prepared to ask for forgiveness from all these victims. I think I need help and if there is anything that can be done to help me with this problem that I have, I will appreciate any kind of help that may be given to me. That is all I want to say. So this wasn't part of Shivani's confession, but when Colonel Marte went into Dr. Gerard Labaskachny's office, and remember Colonel Marte was the gentleman who took Shivani on the pointing out and also to map the GPS locations. Colonel Marte went into Gerard's office and he said that actually while he was busy pointing out the crimes that we knew from the dockets, Shivani also pointed out three other cases that no one knew about. Then on the 20th of July 2010, Shivani pleaded not guilty to any of the crimes that he admitted to and specifically to the ones that he went earlier to point out. And because he pleaded not guilty, it was off to trial for everyone. And it's all fair and well for the police who have gathered information, who have gathered all the dockets, who have gone on the pointing out, who have done the identity parades, and they have all this information now on Shivani. But Shivani is now putting all of these victims through their torment again. They have to sit in the court now with Shivani, face him, and tell their story again to the man who they are pointing out as who have done it. And just before the trial, Gerard actually got a call from the DNA lab to say that five out of the six cases matched. And remember we said earlier that the DNA taken from Princess and her docket did not match Shivani's. But the DNA technician also said that Shivani's DNA matched another two cases that we will talk about now. One was a DNA match from Heelbrow in 2005, and two was a DNA match from Mulder's Drift in 2006. So apparently Shivani had been doing this for a long time. And because of this, Dr. Gerard Lebeskachny really wanted to nail Shivani when they had the chance in trial. But before he could do that, he really wanted to investigate the 2005 case and the 2006 case. And when he went to the Mulder's Drift area, which was the 2006 case, and I do just want to give another warning for this case, but this docket was made by a seven-year-old girl 
who was on her way from school and was then by knife point from an unknown male. And what is even more sad about this case is that not one police officer went to look into her case until j -Rod was knocking on her door asking about it almost four years later. The little girl's name is Tandi and she told j -Rod her entire story very bravely, mind you. So this girl now, when she told j -Rod, was around 12 years old, but she said to j -Rod that she was seven years old at the time and she had actually met Shivani the day before. And when she was walking home the day before, she saw this unknown male walking towards her. He tried to start up conversation, but she was not interested and she continued to walk home. The next day, she saw this man again and she noticed him. But when she got closer towards him, he then grabbed her arm and dragged her into the nearby bushes and where she was then attacked. So Gerard now had this docket with this young girl, but they also still had the 2005 docket from Hillbrow and both Gerard and his team also went there to investigate this docket. But the reason that they struggled to find this one was because it was actually taken by a different detective because this docket was linked to three murders. So while Gerard and his team were waiting for this docket to be sent to him with the three murders linked to it, Tandy was actually being assessed by the teddy bear clinic to see whether she was fit to stand at the trial or whether it would be best for her to just do it behind camera and then to present this camera at trial without any interaction from anybody. The teddy bear clinic then decided that it was best for Tandy to rather do it behind camera and for them to be played in court. So the official trial began on the 1st of November 2010 and one of the curveballs that actually hit this trial was that when Shivani started and he was actually sitting in trial, he then said that he no longer understands English and this trial cannot continue in English. But remember, when Shivani was asked to do the pointing out, he was asked what languages he preferred and he said English, is Zulu and Setswana. But in the trial, he wanted to speak Venda, the language. So a translator was then called to translate everything for him. And during the trial, Shivani said that he did not attack Tandi and he had no idea how his DNA got into a private area. And what was interesting was that he actually claimed that he was a sex worker and that he didn't actually rape any of these women. They were all actually supposed to pay him for what he had done to them. So with these two statements, it was easier to prove that Tandi was by Shivani because there is no way and no legal sense that Shivani's DNA should be in her private area. So they had that one easier. But with regards to Shivani stating that he was a sex worker and that these women had actually been paying customers, that was a bit more difficult to prove because they weren't proving that Shivani had slept with these women. He confirmed that he had slept with them. What they were trying to prove now was consent. And that is why the dockets, the confession, the GPS mapping, the identity rollout, the pointing out was so important. And when Shivani was asked about why he had the victim's cell phones, he said that apparently he usually charged 150 Rand for sleeping with the woman. But because these women wanted to have sex without condoms, that was a 200 Rand charge. And apparently these women did not have 200 Rand on them for this charge. So he then took their cell phones as collateral. Shivani also said that he never once offered them employment and that they were lying about that. But I guess sadly for him, it was proven via all the text messages that Captain Suzette had done and investigated that Shivani had actually contacted the victims first. Then once the witnesses were done testifying, the case was then postponed to the 1st of February 2011. Shivani and his lawyer really tried their utmost hardest to disrupt this trial. And for example, at one point, Shivani said that all of his confessions and the pointing out and everything was fake and that he never said any of those things because the police had apparently beaten him and that he was coerced into doing this. And Shivani's lawyer, for example, also would randomly start feeling dizzy and faint during the trial. But then on the 13th of April, 2011, the trial was concluded. And then on the 6th of June, 2011, the judge then commenced with his verdict. And in the end, Shivani Poppy was found guilty on all 11 counts. And everyone was shocked when Shivani was called to the witness stand. And he started off by stating that he had a problem. And he told police he did in his confession. And he said, quote, Your Worship, I once had a problem. And then I went to Moldersdrift police station to inform the police officer there that I have got a problem. That the time when I was arrested, your worship, I told them that I got a problem, that I cannot tell my friend, 
all the police about this problem. That is, when I told them that I'm looking for professional persons so that I can be able to narrate my problem to the particular person, maybe that person will help. That is when after my confession, your worship, or the last paragraph of my confession, I told them that I'm looking for a sister. The judge then asked Giovanni, are you telling the court that you did indeed raise these complaints? And the child then, sir. Shivani then said, yes, your worship, end quote. But in the end, Shivani Poppy was sentenced to two life sentences, one of Tandi and another life sentence because for another victim, he had in both areas of her private area. He then also received another 50 years for the five women in the docket. So 10 years for each woman. And yes, he will be eligible for parole if he qualifies in 25 years time. And with regards to the murder dockets that we were talking about earlier, Dr. Jared Lewiskachny and his team thought that trying Giovanni on the murders at the same time as would be detrimental to their case because they were worried that the woman would not be able to wait around for this case coming back. It was very expensive and they were worried that they were going to lose these women and the confessions and also them being witnesses at the trial. So they did decide to conduct the murder investigation separately. But that is it and thank you for watching these two parts of this Mulder's Drift series. Let me know what you think of the case down below. I hope you're all staying well and safe and not talking to strangers. But thank you again for watching this far and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye!